so <clears throat> what do we have here? Well, I promised you I'd be giving you a look under the hood of the Strobo Con, and so here we are. Um, I actually wasn't planning on opening it up so soon. Uh, later in the evening after that last footage was shot after I uh, did part one of uh, the strobe tuner shootout, uh, the tuner malfunctioned. Um, and I knew right away what the problem was because um, it was the one thing that I postponed replacing because uh, I didn't have the parts on hand at the time and I knew that I was going to go uh, have to go back and replace them at some point and uh, that that time came um, and I'm referring to the filter capacitors and the power supply for this uh, tuning unit. Um, I've already done the filter supply, uh, the, the power supply filter capacitors in the scanning unit. So at this point, this thing is pretty much complete. Um, but anyway, so while I've got the thing open, let's talk about it. Um, so I told you there was a huge tuning fork in there, and here it is. Um, these are the two tines of the fork, and you can see the fork runs all the way from here all the way to here at the back end of it where it is bolted with four heavy-duty <clears throat> heavy duty Allen screws to the, the frame. Um, the pitch adjustment here works by sliding these two weights up and down the length of the tuning fork. Uh, the further out you slide the weights, um, the, you know, uh, the more apparent mass moves towards the end of the fork and the pitch will lower. And likewise, if you slide the weights uh, this way, the, the pitch will raise. It very much works like a trombone in, in that sense. Um, not quite the same uh, principle because we're talking about, you know, pipe length versus, uh, versus sliding mass, but you get the idea. Um, so how, how does the tuning fork work? I mean, it's like, you know, most tuning forks, you strike them and they ring for a while and they stop. So how, how does this tuning fork just go? Um, so the answer is right here, you see these two coils. And what these two coils do is they drive the tuning fork. The, the tuning fork is an, made of a, an alloy that Khan refers to as Conovar. C-O-N-N-I-V-A-R. Uh, if anybody has any information on this alloy, I'd love to, to hear it because I've looked around, I've searched the internet, and I can't find anything mentioned about it other than in con sales literature. Um, so obviously, because this thing is driven electromagnetically, the uh, whatever is in that alloy, it's... I'm, I'm touching a magnetic screwdriver to this very gently, and you can see that, yes, this... This metal does, in fact, um, have some magnetic properties. Um, I'm curious as to what what is the component in there that does that. From the look of it, then the, the color of this thing, I, I would I would suspect there would be some nickel in there, but I don't know. That's just a wild guess. Anyway, so these two coils, one for each time, drive the uh, tuning fork, and these two coils here sandwiched in between them um, they listen to the fork so you can think of those kind of like guitar pickups or like a tape actually a good analogy would be like a tape head on a tape deck um, so that's that's kind of you know very very fine wire many 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 turns it's a, it's a pickup um, so <clears throat> essentially you know, there's an amp right behind here um, in the back there um, I could I guess show it on the camera, but really just think too terribly exciting about it. It's just a 6v6 push-pull parallel tube amp. Um, you know, you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all, and it's, um, you know, it, there's nothing too terribly unique about it. It's, um, other than probably the output impedance of the output and transformer, you know, it's designed for driving a motor and not a speaker. But other than that, really, there it, it's, a, it's a very conventional tube amp. Um, n no tight tolerances or anything fancy. Um, but, you know, the, the funny thing about it is, is it's, this thing is just wildly loose tolerances everywhere throughout the circuit. 
um, and the circuit will run in just about in, in a lot of conditions. I mean, there can be a lot wrong with it and it'll still run just fine because all the accuracy comes from the fork. As long as the circuit's working enough to keep that fork going and output a signal to the motor, it's going to work. Um, the filter capacitors the other day finally gave up to the point where there was just no longer enough voltage to drive the motor and the motor started gradually kind of slowing down and freaking out and uh, and I had to shut it off. So anyway, it's fine now. I, I replaced those filter capacitors and that cured it instantly. Um, so yeah, um, one other thing about calibration. Um, really calibrating this fork is a very, very, very time consuming and precise and careful operation that would be a couple of videos all by itself. Um, if somehow you are lucky enough to have it to where it is within one or two cents of being dead on against you know a reliable source like the Keithley meter that we checked um, what you can do is you can loosen these two screws here and shift this plate just a little bit to get the needle pointing at zero when you have the the instrument zeroed out that's kind of how you do the very last fine adjustment of this needle um, before you do that though you want to make sure that there's no play in this needle um, if it if it has any play in it at all then of course the accuracy of the reading will be affected um, there are lots of things that typically need to be done inside this knob thing it's several stacks of um, uh, washers and and uh, you know cogs and stuff that are on a shaft and um, they they're, they need to be greased and they need to be smooth and not binding. Um, if when you turn this knob, there's any binding at all, any sticking, and it goes kick, 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 you know, like something like that, then then this mechanism is probably where the problem is going to be. It needs to be taken apart, completely cleaned, lubricated, and put back together. If you do that, be very careful with these bands, not to damage the copper bands. Um, yeah, so again, I, I would cover that more in, in an advanced restoration video. Um, but just, you know, just know that if you're getting binding in this mechanism, you're never really going to get the thing zeroed out. It's, it's pretty much impossible to feather it into the kind of stability uh, that we were showing in the last video if this thing is binding at all. Uh, another thing that deteriorates is these uh, rubber uh, washers that shock mount the unit to the frame. Um, those were all made out of a very soft gummy latex and they were crumbling apart. Uh, these washers I put on here are considerably harder and I was frankly worried that they wouldn't give the kind of isolation that the softer ones do, but they seem to be working fine. Uh, I don't seem to be having any problems with those. Uh, so, well, let's turn the unit on and uh, let's take a look at the fork in action. Um, I'd be very surprised if the camera picks up any motion of the fork. It's it's visible to the naked eye, um, but you don't really see it moving. It just kind of looks blurry. It's strange. It's, you, you look at it and you feel like your eyes are not focusing. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Let's fire it up. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that behind this unit here is a piece of like acoustic tile it's like a thermal and and probably noise barrier as well to separate the amp and the fork um, Khan claims that the fork is temperature compensated but obviously trying to keep it from drifting in temperature too much is, an, is a good idea to stabilize the unit uh, when I first started looking at this material I got scared that it was asbestos um, it looks like asbestos uh, but I did, you know, I very carefully pinched a little piece off with some tweezers and took it outside and put a match to it and quickly determined uh, by the way it was burning that it was certainly not asbestos. Um, this is a mid-70s unit. I know this unit was designed in the 30s. I do not know what material that they used in this unit throughout the production run. I would consider it a possibility, depending on when you got your unit, I would consider it a possibility that there could be an asbestos tile in it. This one's not. It's made in the 70s. It's not asbestos. I tested it. But before you start you know, running wires through the hole and bumping up against this and dragging your screwdriver against it and creating dust, um, it probably wouldn't be a terrible idea to pinch a little tiny piece off where you know there's a little hole behind here where the wires pass through. I would just pinch a little tiny piece off with some pliers 
um, put it to a, put a lighter to it. Um, if it's asbestos, it's just going to be completely unfazed by the heat. If it's this kind of paper, pulpy, cellulose acoustic tile stuff that that this one's made of, um, you'll see it burn. Uh, so anyway, the unit is warmed up. The fork is in full operation. I'm going to kick the motor over to running on the fork. And you know, as I suspected, um, at least from the tiny little screen that I'm looking at here on the camera, it doesn't really pick up too much movement in the fork. Um, if I had to judge with my naked eye, I would say that the fork tines are probably oscillating a half a millimeter in either direction. Um, you know, so uh, maybe close to maybe close to a millimeter of total deflection um, or maybe not quite that much. Uh, it's visible, but it just looks blurry. Um, and again, to um, make the pitch lower, we just slide them this way and to raise it, we slide the weights that way. It, it couldn't be simpler. Um, but for this to have the kind of stability and accuracy that we were talking about, um, this all has to be tight, you know. You can't have any looseness in screw. You can't have any kind of play in this thing. Um, so um, th there it is. Um, that is the inside of this unit. There's really not a whole heck of a lot more to explain than that. I mean, it's a tuning fork. Now right, I'll show you one thing just to prove to you how integral the tuning fork is to the circuit. If I stop this tuning fork with my fingers, the motor will just instantly stop. So well, let's do that. Probably not the greatest thing to do to it. It's probably not kind to the motor, but you know, intermittently it's not going to hurt it. So here we go. Yeah, so you see what I did there? <laughs> I grabbed the fork and it, the motor just instantly stopped And in order to kind of put that test to an end and not you know, harm any part of the circuit. I just gave the gave the fork a quick tap to get it going again. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, oh, one thing I would point out here is this little calibration sticker I put on there about oh, a little over a year ago. Um, I had it out to 55.000 hertz as measured on the key plate. And when it got to thermal stability, um, the drift was within the margin of plus or minus 0 0.003 hertz. Um, so anywhere from 55.003 uh, all the way down to 54.997. So with, within that tolerance is where the fork would stay for hours and hours and hours. Um, it took several months, well, at least a couple of months of trial and error and allowing the thing to run for hours to reach stability and kind of break in and then make tiny little adjustments and then allow it to, to break in some more before it finally stabilized out and I was able to get it out to this kind of accuracy. Um, as you can see, the thing is largely mechanical. If your unit has been dropped, banged around, um, left in bad weather, any number of things, it's going to affect the accuracy of this fork. So, you know, hook it up to a reliable source and measure it see if it'll zero out. Again, if it's only off by a cent or two, you can generally just loosen these two screws and get your needle back at zero by moving this around. But if you're having any binding in the tuning mechanism at all, if it sticks when you try to adjust it, you're going to need to take the whole thing apart, clean it, lube it, put it back together, and observe the exact order that the washers stack on underneath this knob um, when you take it out. There's both thick ones and thin ones that need to be put back all correctly. Um, so there you go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is kind of a short part two. So part three coming up will be uh, more. We're going to do more tests um, against these tuners. Um, I've got a Korg rack tuner, uh, the very popular model. I forget what it is off the top of my head, but it's the one that you see on stage all the time. And um, Got one of those, and got some other some other fun toys. We've got some musical instruments we're going to test. We've got a Deegan marimba from the 1920s. Let's see how far out a 1920s wooden instrument has drifted. 
and uh, we got a Hammond organ. We've got all sorts of fun things that we're going to actually hook up to the to the meters and check it out. And then we're going to get back into the Strobo tuners and um, and discuss them some more. All right, cheers. Well, actually, I think leaving was a little premature because I forgot to do one thing I wanted to show you, which is the Keithley here uh, hooked up to uh, one of the oscillator uh, leads in the tuning fork circuit. And I wanted to show you the kind of frequency stability that it has. And as you can see, it's it's right at 50, I mean, it's 54.999998 hertz, 55.000001. So that right there is stable as hell. I mean, that is way past the realm of any kind of audible anything. Um, and that's some serious stability. Um, now, it's hard to keep this unit that centered on 55.0000 uh, without a reference, like a meter of, of, of the Keithley to, you know, periodically touch it up unless you disable the adjustable uh, tuning circuit. And that, um, then higher accuracy is possible. But that's a serious modification. Anyway, there you have it. Um, there is there is the frequency output from the oscillator and as you can see it is uh, with five decimal places past uh, 55 there um, that it is three decimals of zeros so um, depending on temperature and warming up um, I am comfortable that it will stay within plus or minus point zero zero three and uh, might even stay tighter than that. All right. This is goodbye for real on episode number two.